I just want to put a question to each of you. It's not necessarily debatable, although maybe we'll see where it goes. Uh, I'm going to start with Stephen Moore. The question I want to ask all of you is, what is the biggest challenge facing the economy in 2018? You know, I, I think that's a tough question, but I'm going to go with, um, I'm very worried that we're making the same kinds of mistake in the housing market that we made in 2006 and 2007 and 2008. Um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which I think were at the center of the, of the crisis, but pro providing 100% guarantees on mortgages with one, two, three percent down payments um, was a catastrophe. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, we learned nothing. We learned nothing from the financial crisis. Fannie and Freddie and other uh, you know, units like Federal Housing Administration are doing the same thing. And I worry that um, we could see another housing uh, panic. And I, I fervently hope that I'm wrong about that. But um, you know, my housing policy should be, I'm old fashioned. You know, if we just had a policy 10% down payment, there would, there would never be another housing crisis again. Hmm. Denby Samoyo. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of going to go against my profession uh, as an economist and say I think that the biggest risk we have is geopolitics. Um, I have to say it's become a veritable jack-in-the-box. Every day you wake up, God knows what's happening, in particular from the United States. Um, and this has to do with every aspect of public policy in terms of, uh, really, I don't know where we're going in terms of education policy, in terms of um, health care policy, but also more generally, I mean, this is the leading economy of the world in terms of GDP, but also in terms of really ideology, certainly in a post-Washington consensus world, and until China emerged. And we do look from around the world where 90% of the world's population lives, looks to the United States states to be a beacon um, in terms of showing us the right path for not just economic success but political um, success also. And my concern right now is that there's been a lot of credibility lost. Um, I think there's a lot of um, skepticism around the democratic process. Um, there's far too much short-termism, um, really pandering and courting and catering to short-term uh, interests to try and garner votes with little consideration for the long-term, which we've already talked about here. Um, so I will just say that the geopolitical environment um, really, I, I say geopolitical, but I really mean from the leader, from the the leading nation in the world, the United States, is of deep concern to me, and I think of many people um, around the world also. And do, you, and do you see that echoed in other countries? Let's see it again. Do you, do, you see the, do you see this tendency echoed in other countries? Or? Yes, absolutely. So I've been very fortunate. I've traveled to over 80 countries around the world. I think even places like China, a lot of people talk about China. China is the lar second largest economy in the world in GDP terms. But in per capita income terms, it, you know, some rankings put it at number 100, um, you know, worse than many countries in South America and Africa and, and places in Asia. They've got enormous issues that they have, they're grappling with. Um, and we need guidance. We need guidance and environment. We need R&D. We need innovation. Those things cannot come from places where people are just trying to eke out a living. They come from places where there's ab ability to flex your mental muscles and to have the opportunities to, to you know, co collaborate and, and to debate. And unfortunately, um, I think I, I liked um, this idea of the distraction that Gillian touched on. I think that we are too distracted right now with trivialities. And what is at stake is enormous. I think it's actually human progress. Simon Johnson. I'm not sure the last time you had the opportunity to visit the perhaps greatest icon of American democracy. I'm speaking, of course, about the Statue of Liberty in, in New York Harbor. The last time I was there, not too long ago, it did not say on the inscription, send us your well-to-do people who are already well-educated and from nicely run democracies. <laughs> You know what this country is about because you either came to this country or your parents came to this country or your grandparents came to your country or someone who you remember and reference and speak about came to this country. And you know what? It wasn't easy for them. It was hard work. And they were not necessarily always welcomed, although there have been moments when immigrants were more welcome. There have also been moments when it was more difficult or as difficult for Irish people or Italian people or Jewish people to come to the United States. The greatest danger, and my greatest fear for, for next year, John, and going forward, is that we will go massively into an anti-immigrant phase. Immigrants 
help move this country forward. Immigrants, more immigration will help, in a, done in a responsible way, will help get you to the growth targets that, that Stephen rightly dangles before you. If you turn against immigrants, and there is a proposal on the table, supported by President Trump, from two Republican senators, to cut legal immigration from a million to half a million. If you do that, your growth targets, Stephen, are going to disappear. Right. Like sa sand through your fingers. Jason Furman. The best line, the best line, John, naturally, comes from that other icon of American culture, the musical Hamilton. I think I've got this right. Immigrants, we get the job done. That's right. <laughs> and Jason Furman. But, uh, reminds me of a panel I was on with a German CEO that creates a lot of jobs in America, has a lot of plants in America. He said he was having a really hard time dealing with regulation in America, had to hire several more people to navigate all of the way we're applying our immigration rules now. And because of that, he was creating less jobs in America. So if you can still vote on the regulation one, um, factor that one um, into your vote. I have... Um, my, my concerns, like Dembiza and, and uh, Simon's, are about the long term. I, I'm less concerned about 2018 than just about any year in the last decade. Um, in part, that's because if something bad happens, it won't be my fault. Um, <laughs> but it's also because we're going to have hundreds of billions of dollars moving into the economy. We have a certain amount of momentum. We have a certain amount of global momentum. But if you ask me to actually answer the question of what I'm worried about in 2018, um, it's the lack of fear that I have and so many others have. The price of risk right now is very low. Expectations are very high. If those get disappointed, there's a, some chance of a wily e. Coyote moment where you look down and there's nothing beneath you and you keep going down. Um, that's not my prediction for the year, but if it happens, you can say I put a 30% <laughs> chance on it and told you here um, tonight. And if it does, I think it'll happen in Jillian's way. It'll happen not with three or four rate hikes from the Fed, which is fine and we can handle. It would happen with a much more dramatic revaluation of interest rates across the board, something that governments, businesses, and private investors aren't fully prepared to handle. Thank you, Jason. And Jillian Tett. <laughs> well, I would echo much of what Jason and Simon and the others have all said, but I'd like to basically finish by going back to where I started, which is with Pyongyang. Mm. Because we now know that President Donald Trump knows where Pyongyang is on a map. <laughs> he might even be able to spell it. <laughs> but Pyongyang stands for this incredible geopolitical risk, which is rising right now. Um, I was very struck because I was reading a book about a year ago about the preparations that the U.S. had made for nuclear war back in the 1950s or 60s called Red Mountain. It's a fabulous book, if any, any of you want to read it. I remember reading it and thinking, well, this isn't a very well-timed book, is it? And now you look at that and you think about how the discussion has changed in just a year in terms of the threats to the geopolitical order. You look at the magnitude and the number of threats if you start thinking about the type of cybersecurity threats and think for just a minute what would happen if suddenly the internet was switched off for a week. If you think about the fact that well, we all live at the moment assuming the internet's going to be connected as a single global whole and in fact if you look at what's happening in the weeds it's going into the splinter net where different regions are increasingly taking different approaches towards it and try and imagine what that will mean in the future. If you look at things like the fact that Bridgewater, a big hedge fund, calculates that proportion of the vote in the West that's gone to populist candidates has jumped up from, from about 7% in 2010 to 35% in 2017. And the only time that swing has ever been seen before was just before World War II. When you look at all of those different issues, it's very clear to me right now that hopefully None of them will come to bite this year. But I suspect that if anything's going to derail this sunny economic picture over the next year, it's not going to be about economics, and it's not going to be something that anyone's going to predict with an economic model. So read the FT. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that. Thank you, all of you, for sharing those insights.